Okay, Mr. Marshall, we are live. We are recording. Amherst Media is here with us and you are good to go. Okay, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 20th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.38 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Janet McGowan. Present. And I, Doug Marshall, am present. Uh, Tom Long and Johanna Newman are absent this evening. Board members, if a technical issue arises, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking on the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back onto mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discontin discontinued from the meeting. Okay, so our first item uh, of business this evening are minutes. And um, we'll start with the April 6th minutes, uh, those of our last meeting. Were there any comments from the board on our minutes? Uh, not seeing any. Um, could I have a motion to approve the April 6th minutes as drafted and, and written by Chris and Pam? I move to approve the April 6th minutes as drafted. Uh, thank you, Janet. I do see Andrew's hand. I will second. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. If there's no further comment, then we'll go ahead and have a vote. Uh, starting with Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. And uh, Andrew. Abstain. All right. Uh, Janet. Approve. And I approve. So that's four votes in favor and one abstention. Chris, I trust that's sufficient approval for sufficient number of votes. That's greater than 50% yeah, of the board members. Okay, great. So that was item one on our agenda. Time is 643 and we'll move on to the second item which is the public comment period. I see 12 public attendees in the attendees list. 
uh, attendees, uh, I'll remind you, this is not uh, for uh, comments about items on our agenda this evening. This is for other items which are not on the agenda. I see one hand, Pam Rooney. Please state your name and your address. Hi, I'm Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street, and um, I'm just here to introduce myself to you as the town council's appointed liaison to the planning board. I'm delighted to be so appointed. Um, you happen to be my favorite board in town, so I was delighted that I was given this opportunity. Um, uh, the board is pretty important. It's one that helps set expectations for what development in town can really achieve. So as a, uh, I am the representative from the Community Resource Committee. And I can say that the CRC was very pleased to hear from Christine Brestrup what the, the, uh, the priorities for the planning department and by extension, the planning board were uh, in particular the solar bylaw, the town center design standards, uh, the comprehensive review of all the parking opportunities for facilities in the town center, as well as the Boltwood garage growth capacity. So we finally pin that, that little sucker down and get that information in place. Um, the CRC priorities have not been formalized yet beyond the several that were just mentioned. Uh, so I look forward to conveying to you as those develop and uh, um, interact with, with you at that point. Uh, if there is seriously anything that you want from town council or that I can assist you with in this process, I am very happy to help you in any way that I can and um, appreciate being able to sit in the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Are there any other public commenters this evening? All right, I don't see any hands from the public. Uh, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah, I was wondering if it is, is uh, Pam's role as liaison, is that something that she would kind of be, you know, a panelist moving forward or how is that working? Because right, I know there are a lot of liais liaisons. Uh, it's my I understanding that she, her, she is almost purely an observer. Okay. Um, and so I think the primary purpose is for her to report back to CRC and council on anything, any items of interest that she's heard from the planning board discussing. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So I don't see any other hands from the public. Um, that was the second item on our agenda. I know there's interest in Moving along this evening. Um, so the time is 6.46 and we can move on to item three on the agenda, which is a request for release of lots. Uh, SUB 1989-13 Amherst Hills subdivision from Tofino Associates. Uh, discuss completion of roadway construction, review punch list, discuss possible site visit, discuss requests to release lots and possible vote. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. I assume you'd like to introduce the discussion this evening. Yes, thank you. I would like to give some introductory remarks. Um, so uh, first of all, the Amherst Hills subdivision has been under development since the early 1990s. Um, the last time the planning board um, discussed it was I believe in January of 2021, but there's been kind of an ongoing discussion by the planning board about this project. <clears throat> the project was originally proposed by Jeffrey Flower, a developer who began the Amherst Woods development and also the um, Hopbrook and Kestrel uh, Lane developments. Um, <clears throat> several things happened along the way to slow down the development of the Amherst Hills subdivision. There was an economic turndown in 2008 that lasted a number of years and it caused a slowdown in the work and the sale of lots. And the developer, Doug Cole of Cole Construction and Tofino Associates um, passed away shortly after 2008. Um, so business was difficult uh, as 
Doug's successors tried to pull things together following his death. Um, the roadway itself was begun in the early 2000s. The roadway was constructed primarily um, the base course and the utilities, but the top coat was not installed and it deteriorated over the years. The developer would like the town to take the roadway and that was the intention at the time that the subdivision was permitted. The town's policy has been to recommend not installing the top coat on a road that the town will be taking until most of the houses are built because the town doesn't want heavy equipment to travel over the top course until the subdivision is complete. So this works for small subdivisions, but not so well for large ones. And this one um, has taken a long time to complete. In this case, the development is so large that it could not be completed quickly. And so the base course deteriorated over time and other aspects of the infrastructure also deteriorated. The Amherst Hill, as I said before, Amherst Hills, the roadways were always expected to be taken by the town. Um, some roadways in town are not expected to be taken, such as Swallow Farms, Vista Terrace. Excuse me, my husband is cooking dinner and he's making pots make noise. I'm sorry for that. Um, and South Middle Street. So these don't um, meet uh, town standards. So those aren't gonna be taken, but Amherst Hills roadways um, do and will meet town standards. So in the fall of 2019, the residents of Amherst Hills came to the town. They spoke with the town manager, the town engineer and the planning board to plead for help to get the roadway completed. Excuse me, Frank, could you stop making so much noise? Frank? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, they came to the town. They talk, spoke to the, yeah, I already said that. Uh, the DPW had threatened not to plow the roadway in the winter of 2019 and 2020 because of the poor conditions of the roadway. So the planning board reluctantly stepped in at the request of the residents and issued a letter to the building commissioner, which was filed at the Registry of Deeds, requesting that the building commissioner not issue building permits for certain lots that had not been built upon until action was taken to fix and complete the way. The lots that are uh, being requested to be released tonight and Mr. Um, Ted Park. Chris, uh, we've lost you. Is, is here as well. Lots that are requested to be released are, you've lost me? Well, we, you, we lost you there for a second. Uh, you froze up and your audio went away and now it's back. Okay. Um, well, anyway, they, uh, the developer has asked for those nine lots that were um, the result. Uh, there were, um, I'm sorry, I got a little bit out of, uh, out of whack because of all the noise in here. Um, so there was a letter written to the building commissioner requesting that he not, um, not issue building permits on nine lots and that the DW issue um, sewer connections on these nine lots. And that letter was filed at the Registry of Deeds. These were lots that had previously been released from a covenant. Um, there were also complications with the Conservation Commission, which caused the developer delays in finishing the roadway. And there's a lawsuit between the developer and the residents, but we're not privy to that lawsuit. We don't really know what it's all about or any, anything about its status. So since we last talked in January of 2021, the developer has finished most of the work on the roadways. And the town engineer says that the roadways are substantially completed to his satisfaction. However, there's still some work both on the roadways and off the road ways that needs to be completed. The town engineer gave us, and he gave us a cost estimate to complete it. The estimate that he gave us was $14,000. The last time we talked about this project, the estimate to complete the work was around $230,000. The town has a three-party agreement, town of Amherst, Greenfield Savings Bank, and the developer to hold $288,995 as security to guarantee that the work will be completed. 
but this agreement is somewhat outdated since the deadlines have passed and the work described in the agreement does not exactly match the work that remains to be completed. But the sum is more than enough to pay for the work that needs to be finished if the developer were to walk away from the project. The developer has requested the release of the lots um, from the notice that was filed at the registry that would allow the developer to develop or sell the lots. Last year, the attorney for residents requested that changes be made to the three-party agreement to which the residents are not a party. And the agreement is complicated and negotiating changes would be challenging. So instead of negotiating changes to that agreement that's in place, the developer has proposed giving the town a check in the amount of somewhere around $30,000 or an amount equal to two times the amount of the work that's remaining to be done. Since the town engineer gave us his estimate of $14,000, um, it, it appears that there's another probably about as much as $11,000 worth of cleaning of draining, drainage structures that still needs to be done. So if I'm understanding this correctly, and I may need to be corrected on this, it, it seems to me that that money would need to be added to the $14,000 to, to come up with a total of $25,000. So if the developer were um, interested in giving the town twice as much as um, the amount of work that needed to be done, it would probably be around $50,000 that, that he would give to the town to be held in escrow. Um, the, so the planning board is being asked to release the lots that were uh, held um, without building permits so that they can be sold. And the planning board needs to decide if it has enough assurance and security to release the lots at this time or if it needs more information. The developer is working with the superintendent of public works and the town engineer to bring the roads up to the condition that the town can accept the roads. And the developer has actually submitted a letter to town council requesting that the town accept the roads as public ways. The developer and the DPW are working very closely together and they hope to accomplish this acceptance by the end of 2022. So I'll stop talking there, but that gives you a background as to what's going on here. And you probably will want to hear from um, the developer, Ted Parker, and possibly his attorney, if he's still here. Yeah, I'm seeing several folks in the public attendees who probably are related to this topic. Um, I had also um, notified Jim Master Alexis that this was going to be on the agenda because he told me that he would like to be notified whenever this case uh, came on the agenda. Thank right, you. Right, and I see him in the attendees too. Okay, so I have asked Mr. Parker to come over, but I'm not sure who else to come over at this point. Does somebody I think want to make a person from Green Miles Lipton, who I believe is um, the attorney uh, okay. for the residents. Um, Jim Master Alexis is, is a resident, and um, I'm not sure who else. Maybe when Mr. Parker starts speaking, he'll mention some people who might be there to speak on his behalf. So we'll start with Mr. Parker. Um, Mr. Parker, I see your name. I see you are not muted, and I see that. And I do not see an image for you. So your camera, if you have one, it's not on. Um, start video. I started video. We'll see if it's, here we go. There we go. Yes. Now we have your image. Great. Thank you all. Uh, I wasn't anticipating that, uh, that uh, Chris would make such a comprehensive introductory uh, a statement. So I have a couple of remarks and I'll edit them on the fly, uh, but because some of them are redundant. Um, so Tofino committed to re completing the roads in the in September of 2019 in a meeting with the lot owners prior to any of the uh, you know legal action or any of the approach that they made to the planning board. Um, despite COVID in 2020, the Tofino did complete the paving of the roads. And then in 2021, we 
continued uh, mopping up the other details that we need to do in order to uh, fulfill our obligation to the town, including the surveying, creating as-built drawings for DPW, setting all of the permanent monuments, um, maintaining the detention basins, cleaning the drainage system for the first pass, and the majority of the DPW punch list, as Chris said. Um, and there remains a short punch list of items. And, and we just found out at 3.20 today that, uh, that uh, Jason Skeels added the, another pass at cleaning the, uh, the stormwater structures. And so um, we added that uh, estimate of that cost to what we are anticipating having to do. Um, and to, I know that there's some questions about the complexity of the, uh, of the three-party agreement. And because there are three parties and every one of those parties has an attorney that would have to be consulted and paid to uh, modify the agreement, it just seemed way easier for everybody if Tofino just took the amount of the punch list as determined by the town engineer, doubled the amount, deposited with the town and, and have that cover the next, you know, three to five, three to six months that it'll take to, to, to punch out the job. Um, and then, um, you know, we're proposing that you uh, that the planning board release the lots when the funds are deposited with the town. Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, an option to uh, to to change the form of agreement, the form of financial guarantee is an option Do any applicant, uh, according to mass subdivision law. And this will just simplify and eliminate all the questions that have arisen about the three-party agreement. Um, again, Tofino has already made the request of the town council in, anticipate, in anticipation of the fact that the town council has not accepted any public way yet as a council uh, and that it would take a long time, a longer time than it would later on because they're gonna have to consult with, um, you know, Koppelman and Page to make sure that they cross all T's and dot all I's. We made that request uh, a while ago, figuring that it, it could take well through 2022 for, for the actual process to happen. And we've made that request of, uh, of, of Belchertown too. There's a short stretch of, of Concord Way that extends into Belchertown and, co and connects to Old Amherst Road. Um, Tofino's attorney has already uh, prepared all of the deeds to convey the right of way to the towns and convey all interest in the uh, various easements um, and other uh, property rights to the appropriate parties. And those have been submitted to the town for their review. And just as a side note, uh, Tofino is soliciting bids now for the completion of the cul-de-sac on uh, Linden Ridge Road. And that's that's all, all I have to offer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parker. You're welcome. Um, Chris, do you have any input from town DPW or the town engineer about uh, this proposal? I do not have any uh, input from the town engineer about the proposal, no. Um, but I suggest that, you know, the planning board may need some time to think about this. They may need some time to um, visit the site. I was going to suggest that you schedule a uh, site visit um, and then, um, you know, come back in a couple of weeks and, and maybe um, by that time we'll have a clearer idea of exactly what the amount is of the punch list items from Jason and um, I'd like to be able to get a statement from someone at the DPW that they feel that this is um, wrapping up and, um, and that you can accept a check to be held in escrow. And then we'll expect to have the roadways finished sometime in the next three to six months. But that I would, I would then recommend to go along with what Mr. Parker is suggesting that once he deposits the check with the town that you would release the lots. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, I, the gentleman from Green Miles, do you have anything you wish to say at this time? Just to thank you, Michael Pill, Green Miles Lipton, Northampton. Um, just to note that the subdivision control law provision Ted was referring to is section 81U, 81 capital U, which um, is very clear that um, the developer is the one who chooses the method. And it says they may from time to time be varied by the applicant. And item two on the list of four items in that section by a deposit of money sufficient in the opinion of the planning board to secure performance of the construction of ways and installation of municipal services required for lots. And so um, I just want to be clear that, and I think Chris certainly was 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 getting there, that your your decision is the amount of money. Um, it the the fact of putting up money is the developer's choice and i think ted is exactly on point it doesn't get any simpler and any direct and any more direct than for the town to have double the amount that comes from the dpw in cash and he is certainly correct and i'm always happy to see clients save on legal bills it eliminates every possible question that might be raised the um the three-party agreement will no longer have anything to do with this subdivision, and any question about that agreement is now irrelevant and moot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pill. Uh, Mr. Parker. Uh, I just want to add one point, and that's that uh, we've already scheduled some of the work to happen in the, in the next week and a half or two weeks. Um, we've been waiting for uh, an exact list from uh, the town engineer, and we received a part of that list today. And so if, in fact, you do what Chris is suggesting and, and revisit this in a couple of weeks at the next meeting or, or delay a decision until then, it may be that the amount of the guarantee will be have been reduced by the fact that we will have already completed some of the work on that list. So I just want to make that clear now so we don't come back in two weeks and we say we want to put up $25,000 because there's only 12 sides worth of work left and it causes some confusion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug, and thanks for the, the presentation, actually both Chris and Ted. Uh, so Ted, uh, actually your your point kind of ties in with one of mine. In, in Chris's introduction, she had mentioned maybe that the scope of work could be a little bit higher and that, you know, at that 2x formula, the number could be, you know, 50,000. Um, hopefully you'll get work done, but I'm just wondering, you know, if we can hopefully save time at the next meeting, would, would, uh, would you be prepared to pay up to 50 if uh, if it was deemed that that's the appropriate 2x value? Uh, yeah, I didn't make, if I didn't make that clear in my remarks, I that's exactly the amount we have. Okay. To okay, great. I may have misheard something earlier then. Okay, no, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Janet. So um, I went out to the roads today and I was walking through the detention pond thinking, why don't we simplify this with just an putting money in escrow. So I think this is a great solution. Um, it's super simple. It will, you know, it's really great to see that almost, almost all the work is done. Um, my only request if we if we do this at the next meeting is to look at a draft, uh, a draft ag escrow agreement so we can just look at the terms and see if everything's tidy. Uh, Chris, were you expecting there to be an escrow agreement associated with this? I think that would be a good idea. I was expecting a letter of some sort, but an escrow agreement would probably make sense. Yep. And Mr. Parker, that would be something you would draft? Uh, if, the, if you're requesting that we draft it, then I will look into it for sure. Um, I, guess, I guess we are. Uh, <laughs> we sort of happened into that. Chris sounds like she thinks that would be a good idea. Um, so uh, I, it seemed to me you were probably the right party to be drafting it. Chris, it, do you have any objection to that? I don't. Um, often these um, escrow amounts come out of 
a covenant, which um, or they sort of evolved from a covenant, and this um, development did have a covenant on it. I, what I've seen in the past is a letter that has been given to the town along with a check um, describing, you know, this check is coming as a result of work that still needs to be done, and we expect the town to hold this in escrow. So, in that, in in itself is a form of an agreement. It means that the developer is agreeing to do this. Um, so would we want the town to agree to that also? And who at the town would agree to that? Would it be the chairperson of the planning board or, um, or would it be the town manager? In my mind, it should be the chairperson of the planning board. Um, Steve Schreiber, who was chair of the planning board was a signatory to the three-party agreement. Um, Mr. Uh, Pill may have a suggestion as well, yes. so I want to hear from him. Yes, Mr. Mr. Pill. Thank you. I don't know if any of you remember uh, the late Jim Smith, who was for many years the Amherst town engineer. He taught me what he called the KISS principle, keep it simple. And given the fact of the statute, I think what no one needs is to have this now go around, have a draft agreement sent to town council, and then we come back in two weeks and now somebody wants it sent to the town's lawyers. And by the time you know that all gets done, the building season is halfway through. I can comfortably suggest that all Ted needs to do is hand over a check for 50,000 or whatever is 2X the amount that you get back from the DPW, and he puts on the check, um, deposit of money, Mass General Laws, Chapter 41, Section 81U. And what that does is it puts you, the planning board, in control. We don't need to fool around with any kind of uh, anything beyond that, because the statute says sufficient in the opinion of the planning board to secure performance of the construction of the ways. In other words, what I think we're prepared to do, given the fact that the law is so clear, is put 50,000, whatever is 2x the amount, as Ted has noted, in your hands, and you have the say as to when that amount is um, released, and that's it. Uh, I don't think anything else needs to be done. Um, I can understand you wanna go out and look at this. You wanna take uh, uh, some time to talk to the DPW. Beyond that, for gosh sakes, let's keep it simple and get it done. It's been going on for, as Chris has noted, uh, more than long enough already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pell. Chris, you have your hand up? I think the least we could expect is a letter a cover letter with the check describing what the situation is and what the money is being turned over to the town for. And Mr. Um, Parker would sign the letter and then the planning board would vote to accept that letter and that amount. That seems to be a, a reasonable way to conduct this in my mind. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Parker. Uh, I, I, I agree with Chris. I mean, I think that if you were to ask the treasurer of the town, you would find that there are many, many, many of these kinds of deposits made with the town and very few of them actually go to the trouble of executing a complicated escrow agreement. I think that it's pretty straightforward what our obligations are. They're already been defined, they're being agreed upon, they're being publicly disclosed. It's nothing uh, unusual. And, and um, I think that, you know, the only provision that I might add to a, uh, to a, um, to uh, some kind of letter is that upon approval by the DPW, because it's truly, I mean, the, the, the I understand that the planning board um, is the ultimate arbiter of it, but the, most of these questions are technical questions that the DPW will be reviewing and deciding. So, um, or at least in consultation with the DPW. So yeah, I'm happy to write a letter. I'm happy to you know run it by, I'll send it to Chris early, hopefully, and uh, we can look at it at the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Jack Jemsek. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I don't feel like, you know, uh, you know I, I, I don't have a, <laughs> a burning desire to go out there and do a site walk. I mean, I, I'm really would be relying on Jason Skeels uh, to kind of like firm up, uh, 
his opinion that that we can you know sign off on this and also i'm very interested in um uh, you know some of the you know upcoming uh speakers there you know in amherst hills um uh with regard to you know for instance master alexis um so i you know i'd like to hear them but my, you know i'm kind of leaning like i'm not sure we need to do a site visit uh out there um and again you well, know, it, uh, thank it, you jack yeah um, I will say that if I'm a party to this, I, I'm going to want to go out and look at it. Um, so, Pam, um, I'm seeing uh, Mr. Master Alexis in the public commenters, and he has his hand raised. I think we should let him in and see what as he'd like to say. Bring him over as a panelist? Yes, please. Okay, Mr. Alexis, I see you among the panelists. If you could give us your name, and I believe you have an Amherst address. I, uh, excuse me, I didn't hear what you said, uh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yes, if you could uh, introduce yourself with your name and your Amherst address. Oh, great. All right. Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is James Master Alexis, and I live in Amherst at 35 Linden Ridge Road, uh, and I've lived here for about 17 years. Thank you. Uh, did you have any comments you wanted to be make to make about the proposal on the table to receive yes, I do. the yes, I do. deposit amount? Yes, I do, uh, and, and other things. Uh, first of all, uh, I was unaware of the deposit amount in this discussion until tuning into this meeting. So I think that is a positive development. And I also, I think it's a positive development for a couple of reasons. You know, I, I'm not a person that does construction. But you know, the, we've gone from $14,000 in the town engineer's punch list, then some extra things for the detention pond and we're up to 25, and then doubling it seems reasonable, but there's always things that happen, generally speaking, in construction where costs are increased or it's more than you think. So I think that that's a positive development. And it actually addresses one of the concerns that I had in the letter that I sent to you asking for clarification from town council about how to reach funds in the third uh, three-party agreement, because that doesn't happen very often to my knowledge. So if the money is deposited, that's a good, that's a good thing. And we all wanna be reasonable here, okay? Um, I think the, um, Mr. Pill says something interesting, keep it simple. Uh, the KISS principle, well, the, actually the, the simplest way to do this really is to release the lots, which are the security for this <clears throat> project in addition to the three-party agreement, release the lots when the work is done, because that would be simpler. If the work is done, release the lots. I know they're close and that's fine, um, but if the work doesn't get done, say the check gets deposited and then they don't do the work, and then you have a situation where that I believe the town is gonna have to do the work themselves or hire contractors, and use the $50,000 to get the work done. And I think the simplest issue here is, or solution, is to get the work done, okay? And then release the lots. But we don't wanna be unreasonable, because I wanna say, you know, I wanna say thank you. Many of the members of the planning board here didn't uh, live through the hearings that we went through in 2019 and 2020. We had detailed meetings, hearings, by the way, that Tofino never attended, okay? And the planning board voted six to nothing. I didn't see any reluctance. It was a six to nothing vote to place these moratoriums on Tofino. And they worked. The work was done. And I have to say, Tofino did a very good job. The roads look great, okay? I'm not an engineer. I'm not a person that does construction, but the roads look great. And if Jason Skeel is happy with them, we're happy with them, okay? Um, but I want to say a couple things. I think Ms. Brestrup's um, summary of the matter was right on. And I think Ted's was too, with one exception. In September, and I'm not going to rehash everything here, in September of 2019, yes, Tofino said that they would finish the top layer of the road, but they wanted us, the residents, to repair and reconstruct that's because that's Guilford Mooring wanted the roads reconstructed 
They wanted us to pay for the reconstructing of the bottom layer of the road, okay? We're not a construction company, they are. And in the three-party agreement in paragraph six, it says the amount of security shall all times bear a direct resemblance, yada, 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 to the effects of inflation, delays of construction, damage to, pre uh, damage to previously completed work. They had, they had in the three-party agreement, bonded, and I know that's the wrong legal term, but verified that they were responsible for the previously completed work, including the bottom layer of the road. But that's sort of water under the bridge here. That's a subject of a lawsuit. Who's gonna pay for the repair of the bottom layer of the road, okay? I'm happy where we are. I would prefer Tofino, that you say to Tofino, go get it, finish the work and the lots will be released. What if we get into a situation that it's 50 in good faith, we all think it's 50, and I'm sure Tofino in good faith thinks it's $50,000 to finish. Well, what if it's not? Where, do, where, where are we then? And really it's the responsibility of the planning board to protect citizens of Amherst in this circumstance when development is done. And that's why we came to you. And I wanna thank you. Our neighborhood is in a much better spot now than it was in 2019 when Tofino was refusing to fix the potholes in the neighborhood um, unless we paid for them, okay? So all that's under the bridge. There's a lawsuit pending. I don't wanna discuss that. We're in a better spot, but I would ask you the better course of action is to ask them, when is the work gonna get done? When can you finish the work? If it's July, that's not too far. If it's June, we're all in a better spot. How long is this gonna take? I moved in, I was the first person to move into this neighborhood in 2005. I was living here all by myself for a year until other families moved in, okay? That's 17 years. The, the sub, and Chris Brestrup is right, it's a big subdivision. So, and there are reasons why there were delays and I understand that, okay? but it's been 17 years and the subdivision isn't done. I think at some point the planning board has to say, you need to finish and here's the date and give them a reasonable date. You decide, I don't wanna tell you what a reasonable date is, ask them, how long is it gonna take you to do this? And maybe you have them give you the check and say to you, Ted, when can you do this work? And have them give you a reasonable date. So. With all that said, and I hope you all received the letter that I wrote. Um, with all that said, we're in a better spot. They did a good job. I'm glad they're handing over the 50,000. Like I said in my letter, I don't wanna stop anybody from selling any lots. I don't wanna disadvantage them, okay? They own the land, they should be able to build, all right? But we live here, all right? And we really need this to be wrapped up. And by the way, I wanna thank them again for putting in the application to the town council to accept the roads. But I don't think it's too much to ask, to ask them, when are you gonna finish? All right, thank you everybody. Thanks for listening, I appreciate it, okay. Thank you, Mr. Ale Mr. Ex Master Alexis. It's, it's a long Greek name, so it's a long uh, Greek name. I'm so. sorry, I don't come to it easily. That's okay, that's okay. All right. Um, uh, I see both Mr. Parker and Mr. Pill's hands raised. Uh, Mr. Pill, why don't you start? Thank you. Um, what Mr. and Mr. Alexis is trying to lead you into is a serious legal error. Um, withholding the lots is, I, is the third option in section 81U. You have, and the choice is the developers, the statute, is clear. There is absolutely no legal foundation, no legal basis whatsoever for what he is asking you to do. In effect, what he's asking you to do is to violate the law by number one, you choosing which the security is, and number two, you demanding two types of security. Um, with respect to the speculation about what the amount is going to be, um, that's why you have the town engineer, uh, I think 
Ted and I have already made it clear that the amount and the statute is clear. We're just going by the law. It's the opinion of the planning board as to the amount. You go to the town engineer, you tell us what the amount is and the deposit will be double the amount. And that's precisely to provide you with the security you need. And there, that in a nutshell is it. Um, I am disappointed that having said he doesn't want to get into the lawsuit, he then went into quite a bit of it and I'm not going to take that bait. We're going to stick to the issue that is before you here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pell. Um, Janet. So I, I'm content with a letter that explains the escrow, you know, what the money is for and what it will do. Um, I think I would recommend that the planning board um, keep control over the final decision about um, asking the um, um, building commissioner to remove the letters, um, you know, from the registry of deeds. Um, and of course, we will do that based on the advice of our town engineer. Um, and Chris, I would just be happy or more relaxed or reassured if we just ran that by our town attorney to make sure that letter is fine and we'll cover the situation because I just don't want to be in some strange, complicated thing that we didn't expect. Thank you, Janet. <clears throat> uh, Chris, I had a question for you. Um, is there any question about the town accepting the road and does that bear on this question at all? Um, I don't think you need to worry about that right now, but the intention is and has always been that the town will accept the road. And from my conversations with the superintendent of public works, he is also thinking positively about that. He doesn't have any reservations as far as I know. Um, and I think everyone is on board with the idea that the town will accept the road, the roads. Okay, thank you. And so, hey, Maria, I see your hand. Thanks, Doug. I just want to say I was part of the original group that went through the barrage of, uh, I really felt I was bullied personally, but I won't get into that. Years ago when we were, as a planning board, uh, getting um, a talking to from every direction. But anyways, I kind of had the same feeling that Jack had, and I think Jack was there with me, um, that I don't need to see the site, but any of the new members who do want to see the site, that's fine. But I feel like um, a lot of it, like Chris said, was in the hands of Jason's Keels, the DPW to tell us, you know, what they thought was the best path forward. And then I agree with Janet, uh, a quick look from our town council, uh, SEL, not CIL, town council, to, to just make sure it's all legally clean and we're not getting into another mess. It sounds great to me, but I, I personally, um, it, this is all above my pay grade, so I feel like I just want to rely on um, the experts in this, and I think it is um, the people that we're waiting on for more information, but um, I do, I would like to keep it simple as well, and I don't want to, um, prolong it because the building industry right now is in a uh, a real bind uh, so to to expect you know like time frames and how much time is it going to take that's so impossible right now to, to nail down for anyone um speaking as a architect working with contractors um so i'd rather just yeah rely on the engineer the dpw to tell us the best path forward and that as a planning board um <clears throat> As much as we can keep it simple, it'd be great. I, I'd love to see this off the planning board's plate. It's been here um, for years, yeah. All right, thanks, Maria. Uh, so Chris, um, I, I'm hearing a couple of votes for not having a site visit and, uh, but it sounds like we'd still need, a, we need to sort of finalize the estimate of the, uh, the, the work remaining, is that right? Yes, we need to finalize the estimate. And I would like to show um, Joel Bard, who's actually been very helpful in giving us recommendations about this, um, this whole case for years. I would like to show him the letter that Mr. Uh, Parker is going to put together. 
just to make sure that everything is um, nailed down. Okay, and, so, uh, yeah, so we're, we're really not gonna be in a position of voting on this this evening, uh, really in any case. And so um, given that, uh, I think I don't think it would be a bad idea for us to just try to at least schedule a site visit uh, for those of us who have not really been out there. Um, maybe I'm the only one, but so be it. I'll be happy to meet you out there, Chris. I'd like to go back there. Yep. Okay. See how much improved it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Mr. Parker, I see your hand. Yes, I was just going to say, please let me know when you intend to be there. I'd be happy to accompany people and uh, answer any questions that might arise. Thank you. That'd be great. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I just a uh, quick question, maybe clarification to one of uh, Mr. Master Alexis's comments. Um, is there any uh, is there anything on paper or any type of yeah, I'll just say anything on paper that would indicate approximately when the work would get done, right? So like we get the 50,000, it's in good faith, whatever happens, right? And the work doesn't get done. At what point do we take that check, cash it and do the work ourselves? I think that is, it's a, it's a very fair question. I'm just curious if that's part of the documentation that would be provided or if that exists somewhere is, some some element of time boxing around this. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mr. Parker. I think it's a reasonable uh, consideration to a, a, a lay person, but uh, I would say this, uh, and I say this at, <laughs> I say this reluctantly because it's, I'm, I'm not, it, it, I'm not, I, I don't want, <laughs> Don't want to uh, throw anybody under the bus. But um, I've been asking for a list of the catch basins uh, that need to be cleaned again for months in order to schedule the work. I received that list at 3.15 today, knowing that there was a meeting tonight at 6.30 with a request that I get an estimate for that work. And I responded by 6.30. <laughs> Or, uh, you know, then I went and estimated the work myself. So if you impose an arbitrary deadline on this and the completion of the work is dependent upon me getting timely information from the arbiter of whether or not that work is done and I have no control over that, then what do I do? I, have, I need to reappear at meetings and say, but I didn't get the information, so please grant me another two weeks, or please grant me a month. Listen, I want to get this done. I'm, if you think you all are sick of listening, of hearing about it and dealing with it, I, <laughs> I can't explain to you how tired I am of, of dealing with it. I look forward to getting it 100% off my plate. And I have, you know, tempting though it is to dive in to the details that you all have been subjected to over the last two years, uh, I, I don't want to do that because I, I just want to move forward and, and, and finish the project and move on and have everybody move on. You have my, my for what it's worth, you, you have my commitment that I want to get this done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Chris, uh, I see your hand. I was going to suggest that the letter include some intention to get the work done by the end of construction season of 2022. And I, that I, I understand the issues with that that Maria has described and that Mr. Parker has described, but I think it would give the planning board a feeling of reassurance if Mr. Parker were to um, at least state that his intention is to finish the work within the construction season of 2022. I know he's very eager to do that because he wants the town to take over the roads and the town's not gonna take over the roads until the work is done. So he's got that reason as well, but he could make a statement that his intention is to complete the work by the end of construction season of 2022. I'm happy to include that language in a letter. 
Uh, thank you, Chris and Mr. Parker. Uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you a question, not really to be provocative, but partly, be, but basically because I'm curious, um, how was the twice uh, the estimate, why was that multiple chosen and not say four times the estimate or 10 times the estimate? I, I can imagine that if the multiple were higher, it would increase the motivation to finish the work. So I did not come up with that number. Um, Mr. Parker offered that number. Okay, thank you. Offered three times, yep. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Pill. Sorry, I had to unmute. It's not a penalty and it cannot, there's no basis in the law for it to be a penalty. And my understanding and Ted, can dive in if he wishes is um, construction estimates may be off by percentages. I have, and I deal with this land development stuff. I've been doing it for 40 years now. I've never seen uh, an estimate be off by double. Um, Jason Skeels is an experienced, competent engineer. Yeah, maybe by a few percentage points, but not double. And I believe Ted picked double because that already is an amount that is simply beyond the realm of, um, and I see Ted nodding. In other words, let me put it this way. I think both Ted and I have more than enough faith in Jason Skills that there's no way he's going to miss it by anywhere near that amount. He's too good and he's been doing it for just too long. And therefore, I think the answer uh, to Mr. Marshall's concern is that double um, is already uh, plenty. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Andrew. You've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, thanks. I, I just I wanted to just tack on to my last question. I think so. Uh, Mr. Parker made a very interesting point. I, I would first of all, I was not it was not my intention for us to to throw an arbitrary timeline. I would expect you to do that. But the, the point you made, which I think needs to be captured here, is that you, you don't know what you have to do yet, specifically, right? You asked for that work. I would, I would suggest that, you know, if you were to furnish a letter saying, I'll have it done by, you know, I'll, I'll target a certain date, is you would have the conditions that you would need up front to be able to make that assessment. So upon receipt of A, B, C, and D, I will have the work done in six months. I don't know what happened with the catch basins. It was I'm kind of surprised to hear that um, based on everything else that's happened. But um, let's let's be fair to both sides. You need to know what you need to fix um, before you can really could, uh, you know put any sort of commitment out there. So um, that was all I wanted to add. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Mr. Master Alexis, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually ask you to try to limit it to three minutes. No, nope. you want to pass? No, no, no. I'll make it quicker than that. Okay. I'll make it quicker. I, I, I muted myself. I, sorry about that. Um, a couple things. Um, I believe Ted, when he says he's committed to doing it, I do. Um, I think perhaps he needs to get a detailed, maybe you can help him with this, get a detailed list of the work he needs to do from the town engineer. However, on page 15 of your own agenda and packet, there's the punch list from the town engineer. And I'm not gonna go through all of them because one of them says crack, seal, and sidewalk, cut up, repair, sinkhole, $1,000. Another one down, at, we know where the cracks in the sidewalk are. We know where those are. Another, another catch basin needs to be repaired. And I know where that is. You walk out of Mark Schneider's house and take a right, it's a, there's a broken catch basin down in front of the lots that were the subject to the conservation commission. Um, I think it's a lot like seven, eight or something like that. But we know that that work can be done now because they're on the engineer's punch list and they can be done. And I'm sure Ted's correct that that particular list of the catch basins that need to be done, he didn't have. But there's a bunch of work that he does have, okay? And it's on page 15 of your packet. So I, I don't want to pick an arbitrary date either, but I think we need to get to work here because this has been a long, long time. And by the way, I, I'm here as a citizen. I live here, but I've been a lawyer 31 years. I wouldn't ask anyone to violate any law. Okay. I just have to say that for the record and I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Master Alexis. 
Uh, Chris, I see your hand. I just wanted to note that um, it's very hard to get a contractor out to do piecemeal work. So I'm sure that what Mr. Tofino or Mr. Parker is hoping to do is understand this full scope of the work and then get somebody to do all of it at the same time. That way he will be most efficient in time and money. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mr. Parker, did you want to add anything to that? Some of the work that re is remaining is weather dependent. We need to wait for the weather to warm up significantly to do it. Look. For two years, you all have had two financial guarantees on this work, one of them imposed on us against our will, even though, you know, and we didn't attend the meetings because I feel like uh, you were drawn into a private dispute between a developer and some property owners. And it was an uncomfortable position to be in. You took the position you took. We didn't feel it was useful for us to try to litigate before the incorrect body, which is the planning board. So here we are. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think I, I'm a, I live on Woodlock Road. I've lived in Amherst since 1992. <laughs> I'm an Amherst resident. I, 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 and so I, I know how hard it is not to get drawn into just, you know, complicated disputes. But, but I think in this case, uh, with all due respect, I think you should leave the technical questions of what needs to be done and when it needs to get done and how it needs to get done to the DPW and to the town engineer and not to lay people, not to, not to me, leave it to the people who are hired by the town to protect the town's infrastructure and its best interests. And then when they tell you that we've satisfied them and that the work has been done correctly, then we'll, we'll all agree to, to, to move on. And I, I just, I just don't want this to devolve into another complicated um, timeline review, legal review dispute that is just played out in public in a way that is frankly not productive for anybody. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Parker. Jack? Yeah, just I, I think for your benefit, Doug and, and Andrew, uh, Jason Skeels basically when he's doing the assessments is just taking the mass DOT spreadsheet. So standard costs and that sort of thing. And, you know, again, that's why I, I think it's important that he takes a look at this. You know, I, I, I think uh, 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 Mr. Pill is correct. I mean, a double is, is certainly going to take care of any inflationary <laughs> uh, factors that we're all, you know, experiencing, but, you know, it, it's going to be good to get Jason and, and uh, you know, DPW to take a, a look at that one more time and send us a letter. And, and uh, so we'll, you know, we'll right. have a good understanding. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, Mr. Parker, is that hand, I see a legacy? Yes, it must be, I see it's gone. Okay, so um, I think we probably can end this topic for this evening. Um, Chris, uh, we'll put it on the agenda for next, next meeting uh, at the beginning of May. And in the interim, we'll need to collect some information from Jason and have an opportunity to go out there and talk with Mr. Parker on site. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I will email everyone about um, a schedule for a site visit. Okay, is there anything else you wanna get out of this evening's uh, conversation, Chris? I would like Mr. Parker to draft the letter um, that he intends to include with the check so that I can have an opportunity to send that to Joel Bard. And um, so that when we do come back together again, we have all the pieces that we need to um, make make this work. I, I won't get to until early to mid next week. I'm sorry, there, but I'll get it to you as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And it may be unreasonable to um, come back on May 4th it may be necessary to postpone it till May 18th, depending on response that we get from DPW because we wanna get a final punch list from DPW. So we'll try for the fourth, but it could be that it wouldn't be until the 18th in order to get information from Jason Skeels and get a response from Joel Bard and put everything together. I'm just um, letting everyone know that, okay? Okay, thank you, Chris.
All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Parker, Mr. Pill, and Mr. Master Alexis. Thank you everyone for your service and for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the time is now 7.43 and we can move on to item four on our agenda, which is the request for proposals for downtown design standards. Um, Chris, do you want to introduce this or is Nate here to introduce this? Nate is here to introduce this. I wanted to just make a statement though beforehand that um, RFPs are issued by the town manager and that that's what we're working towards here. The town manager has authorized um, the planning department to put together this RFP. So we're seeking your um, recommendations and comments, um, but I just wanted to make it clear that it would be issued by the town manager and not the planning board or the planning department for that matter. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Nate, do you wanna give us a little uh, background or introduction? I, I guess. <laughs> no, um, thanks. So yeah, the, uh, you know, we do have funding available for, you know, about $100,000 for a consultant or consultants to look at downtown design standards. And, you know, I think it wasn't, um, you know, staff made the decision to call it downtown design standards as, a as opposed to form-based code. So, you know, there's probably a number of ways it could be semantics, um, you know, and so what we're asking for is, you know, I'm not, I'm, I can share my screen, but I'm just gonna just kind of describe it. You know, we're asking for a consultant to come in and hold a public process to help determine the boundaries of what, you know, kind of what downtown is and where these design standards would apply. Um, you know, research existing zoning, uh, perform case studies, you know, use visual preference surveys or other surveys to get community input. So that, you know, this is a really like, a, this is a two year process, right? From start to finish. So this isn't something that's gonna be done in six months where we think that this will take a lot of time, a lot of iterative process. Um, so anyways, they'd have this one task. These first few tasks are, you know, assessing existing documents, research, community outreach, and then um, coming up with design standards. So you know, actually coming up with everything from graphics and narrative to text of what, um, you know, could be sub design areas, right? Different design areas, one big area, but we, we're assuming that there may be different standards applied to different areas, but really coming up with a comprehensive um, set of regulations that could be adopted as an overlay or as base zoning, but it would really take over, you know, from table three and the use regulation. So they would have really comprehensive standards in terms of density, height, um, siting on lots, uh, distance from curb, setbacks, materials. And it really would be um, a really complete set of standards that could go in place of uh, the existing zoning. So, um, you know, and it could be really specific that along North Pleasant Street, there's, an, a, there's a certain type of setback, there's a certain height, and if we think the design standards should apply on North Prospect Street facing residential neighborhoods, there's a different set of standards. Um, and it may be that the consultants recommend zoning changes. You know, we're not limiting this to just the BG area or BL or the surrounding residential districts. We're really asking the consultant to come up with what is the appropriate area to look at. So over the years, we've had consultants come for the housing production plan, the 40R, um, and when they drive around downtown, you know, they've looked at the gateway, you know, it was considered the gateway, the corridor between um, downtown and UMass. And they said, wow, you know, where, where the fraternities were removed. Wow, this is an area that could be considered. They see, you know, the Bank of America, the lot, the parking lot on South Prospect. And they also see this as a potential area. So really it's through community input and also the consultant's expertise, what, you know, what is the appropriate area to apply these? And it's, you know, then a local decision, right? So what, how do we want to do it? But we really want the expertise of the consultant or the team to have this outreach, have, you know, have experience doing this and then spend time developing it and refining it. And then, you know, preparing something that is, you know, could be adopted as both zoning and general regulations. So most of this would probably be as, you know, a zoning measure uh, but there could be regulations related to signs or things in the public right of way that would be in the general bylaw um, that would also be adopted um, by town council. Um, most of it is, you know, would be considered zoning or part of land use. Um, I will say that 
you know, I looked at a number of communities. Um, you know, it was probably about a half dozen. Northampton recently finished their process, or you know, I guess it's finished um, um, for you know downtown in Florence. That that was a you know that was a multi year process. Um, different different types of um, exercises and approaches. So we you know we talked to those uh, consultants and we looked at other communities. Um, the listserv had a few. The mass planners listserv had. Um, some discussions about this. And so, you know, I'm considering it almost like a little mini master plan for the downtown um, and to try to get some consistent idea for visioning. And so, you know, in the, in the document, we have, you know, five tasks. We have pretty detailed deliverables, pretty detailed tasks. And then we have, as a request for proposal, you make a decision based on the proposal, um, not on the price. And so, you know, um, there's a review team that's appointed by the town manager that would review proposals using, you know, first they have to meet minimum criteria and then they get reviewed using the comparative criteria. Um, and so, you know, we have a number of criteria there. One is an interview, you know, one is, um, you know, their methodology approach. So we expect a narrative to document how they will, um, you know, work through this process and project. We have a community, community engagement plan. So how are they, going to describe outreach methods. What are they doing to go beyond just having a public meeting at town hall, but what are the other things they're doing? Um, you know, the expertise of the team. And so once we, if, you know, if there's a, hopefully through that process, there's a, a someone that, you know, the team recommends. And then, it, you know, then we would look at the price. So really it's based on qualities and their proposal. So their response to it. Um, Interestingly enough, a few consultants we've discussed, we've asked about this, they've said we, they would, I think it's a lot of work for a consultant or a team, right? Architects and engineers put together a proposal. And so some have recommended, well, have a really, um, have a high threshold for minimum criteria and then just take the lowest bidder, right? Take the lowest qualified response, uh, which, you know, is one way to go about it. But the, the issue there may be that um, it's really hard to exclude a team if they meet your minimum criteria. So you can't set minimum criteria so high that it really is exclusionary, right? You can't prohibit, you know, you can't set it so that you have 50 years experience and only a firm that has, you know, uh, you know, a few employees that have been there, you know, 10 projects of very comparable scale. And really that excludes, you know, half the firms in the region. And so, you know, we think that a request for proposals is the way to go about it because we can then through the, you know, through the proposal document, through what we're asking, uh, what, you know, what some middles we're asking for, we can really um, get the best team. Uh, you know, it is pretty detailed, right? So we have, I think it's like five detailed tasks and we, and then we have the comparable, you know, the review criteria. And so some communities keep it pretty general. And I think they hope that they'll just have a good relationship with the, with the team, with the team with the, you know, with the consultant, with the professionals and say, oh, well, we want you to do this. We'd like you to do that. And so we're taking the opposite approach. We're really trying to outline, you know, what we want, what we expect for deliverables, what we'd want for meetings so that, you know, someone coming into this understands that, you know, I'd like to think that if this is a two-year process, we have a meeting every month, they're meeting with staff as needed more than once a month, but we'd have a, you know, a meeting that's open to the public or they'd have, you know, office hours or some outreach once a month and we'd have a consistent schedule, we'd have a regular schedule and that it doesn't, um, there's not a lot of delay between meetings, right? I think when we had our 40 hour process, uh, sometimes it would, you know, there'd be a few months before there was any updates and the, that ebb and flow of the process I think was detrimental to keeping things moving forward. So I'd like to have this be, you know, we're asking for a schedule and a timeline with milestones and I'd like to, you know, that's, What's great about having a request for proposals. We can ask for that and then we can really say, here's what they propose and we can have that as part of the contract document. And so, you know, I'd like to have a process that is, um, you know, it might be long, but really we have it mapped out and we know what to expect. And then we can also then, that helps with engagement, right? So we can tell the public what we're looking for. Here's the schedule. Here's when we want to have meetings and different types of meetings. You know, I'm, you know, in Northampton, they had pop-up shops, right? So like they had the consultant do um, events downtown. And so we're asking the consultant to, you know, maybe attend the farmer's market um, and have a table to get comments, to do a type of maybe online survey, to have office hours downtown. 
um, different strategies to, to get people involved. And, you know, with the older adult survey for the age and dementia friendly um, project that staff is working on, they've done, you know, a survey in different languages. They've had outreach with people helping to go encourage residents to complete that. And so I think there's almost 800 survey uh, responses and that, that's, that's great. And so, you know, it took a lot of time. It took money. It took effort to have that type of outreach, right. To have translation services, to have it both online, to have it mailed, uh, mailed twice actually to have different, you know, point of um, contact surveys where people were handing them out at certain locations. But I think we've seen the effectiveness of that kind of strategy. So I'm hoping, you know, that can be employed with this process, you know, so it can be more than just, you know, here's a public meeting, please come and attend. Let's have some different outreach methods to try to engage the community. Um, you know, I'd like to hear from people who come to downtown and who don't come to downtown, right? What, why don't they come down? What, what could attract them? Is it, is it the type of business? Is it the architecture? Is it both? And then, you know, does that influence the design standards? So, um, you know, I think we're, we have a list of what we want in the design standards. We say may include, we list a number of things, setbacks, dimensional standards, materials, um, building siting. And so, um, you know, as you look at that, if you think there's things that are missing, you know, I think that would be helpful. Like what are some pieces of design standards that could be articulated better in the document? I mean, it's not meant to be exhaustive. I'm hoping that it's, you know, whoever's reading this and responding understands. Um, we're also asking for streetscape guidelines in terms of amenities, um, setbacks, and other things. I will say that there's a grand opportunity this summer um, to apply for uh, the streetscape piece. So we're, we're going to have this be um, included in the request for proposals, and we may have it as an alternate so that, um, you know, if we, if we apply and get this other funding, then this consultant wouldn't necessarily take on that piece and could, you know, concentrate more on um, the built environment and, you know, say from the curb back or something, or, you know, um, just because I think we're asking a lot, you know, hundred thousand dollars seems like a lot, but we are asking for quite a bit of work. And so, um, you know, if we could get the streetscape element taken out and have someone come up with, you know, what is the right roadway width in terms of bike lane sidewalks, you know, we have a 1996 downtown design standards, right? That has the cross hatching of the scoring patterns for the sidewalks with the bricks, you know, course on the sides. And it came up with what we use for trash cans, benches, light poles, and that's really outdated. And so we've kind of rolled that into this process, but really if we could take it out and have, you know, the same or another consultant do it, I think it would be helpful. Um, you know, I think uh, we have, 3D models for designated areas of downtown. So we're not asking for a 3D model of the whole downtown. We're asking, you know, we would determine is it a certain block or blocks or buildings and really ask the consultant to develop, um, you know, 3D models that can help illustrate what they're, what they're talking about. We also want, you know, graphics and other things in the bylaw, but, you know, when we were doing the, proposed BL overlay, staff developed some 3D models and, you know, without putting too much time in, they looked okay, but they're still, they still can be a little hard to read, right? They're not, they're not quite as nice as let say the image behind me. And so I think that becomes really misleading. Even when we did the initial, you know, here's the existing conditions, people are like, wow, that's what it looks like. It's really ugly. And it's like, so unless you're actually going to make it photorealistic and have the topography right and the trees right, it's really difficult to have a 3D model. And so Northampton had it and they showed kind of an oblique image set back and they showed built out scenarios over time, but it was almost at a scale where you actually couldn't see detail. And it was just, it was, I think it was helpful, but you know, so we're not asking for that because it could be a big price component. Um, but we really would like, you know, graphics, elevation sections, um, you know, annotated drawings along with text. So I'm hoping these standards are more than just, you know, kind of like a design review handbook. It's saying, you know, here are measurements for what we think the height could be. So right now, you know, we have height in the BG and anything above that, um, if it's like, you know, HVAC equipment and everything doesn't factor into the height of a building. I'd like these design standards to have absolute height, you know, with or without things on the roof. What does that mean? You know, um, and, you know, on Kellogg Ave, is that four stories? And if there's a fifth, it has to be set back so many feet. Or if the sidewalk is wide enough, it doesn't need to have a step back 
on the upper floors because we have a generous sidewalk width. And so all these questions, you know, we're relying on the consultant to help answer, um, you know, after community input, you know, um, for instance, 11 to 13 East Pleasant is a, you know, the newly proposed building is modern materials, right? It's metal, wood, and glass. Um, you know, it has irregular window pattern. Um, you know, it's, it has, um, it, you know, HVAC and solar on the roof, you know, has um, a certain setback from the street, you know, so, you know, my thought is with these design standards, would it say, okay, if you're this high, this is what we'd want from curb to building, if that's the measurement we want. If there's stuff on the roof, we want it set back this much so it actually can't be seen from the other side of the street. Or if it does have forward facing businesses, the percent of glazing on the first floor, where is the entrance to the, to the businesses? If it's upper floor residential, what does it look like in terms of window spacing and patterns? You know, what are the treatments of the corners of the building and along the roof line, the cornice and the fascia? Um, is there horizontal banding between first and second floors in a mixed use building for signs and for lighting? And is that where it would go? I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that it's a, a recipe for design, but it has enough detail that, um, you know, we, we can kind of anticipate what things could look like. And, you know, in terms of the design review board, they have the design review principles in the zoning bylaw, they have their DRB handbook. And so we're asking the consultants to look at the design review principles in the zoning bylaw, and perhaps these standards replace those and build on them. And the design review board would then be um, applying these standards, uh, these new standards as well. They'd be advising the planning board and zoning board using new standards. And so I think we have a lot in our bylaw and I think some of it's just and we have a lot of existing conditions documents, right? Going back to 2007, we had an urban form analysis report with some kind of preliminary form-based code as part of the master plan. And then since then we've had a number of documents. And so I think we have a lot to work with um, and I'm hoping the consultant can pull it all together with community input and have you know, a really nice set of standards that could be used. Okay, thank you, Nate. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks for walking us through this, Nate. Um, I guess I I was just curious. Um, do you have a sense? I mean, you you described it. You know, we've read it. There's a lot of work in here. Do you have a general sense of how many firms might uh, qualify or, or be interested in this? Um, so I, that that'll be the first half, and then the second half. Yeah, so I think you know, we have a list of maybe a half dozen to eight um, architects, engineer firms. You know, when this would be publicized, it would both, you know, it'd be in the newspaper, it'd be online. So we'd post it with um, maybe Goods and Services Bulletin. You know, it's a, a statewide um, uh, publication. And so anyone who's registered there would get notice of this. So, you know, it becomes, um, you know, available, available publicly. I'm sure third parties would pick it up. So we, yeah, I mean, I think we could have, you know, we could have anywhere from six to 10, you know, responses. And it could be that we have, you know, a local architect may assemble a team, right? It may be a team of engineers, architects, landscape architects, planners that then uh, respond to this. So, you know, if you have suggestions, please send them to us. You know, we can send this to a firm directly as well as, you know, we have to, we have to do the regular procurement of the service. But um, so we, you know, there are some ideas, you know, it's not, you know, for instance, like the Cecil group, which is no longer, but you know, there are groups right out around Boston, around even now in Amherst here, Dawson and Flinker did Northampton, right? So there's someone that, you know, um, they could be sent this. And so we do have a list um, that can, it can grow. We're hoping that, you know, so you're right. So when we would procure, we have to procure this, it becomes a public procurement. And, you know, we have a question and answer period, we could have a site visit. And so it could be that we put this out there and we don't have a lot of response or we have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns about the document. And at that time, the town could issue an addendum to the document, or we could decide to, um, you know, reissue the procurement if we think, you know, something is amiss, right? If it's, you know, for instance, if everyone, if we, everyone says, wow, we think what you're asking for is gonna cost more than what the estimated cost is, right? If everyone's like, wow, I think this is really a $200,000 project and, it seems like you're just asking for too much. You know, you're asking for 20 public meetings or whatever, then the town has to reassess, but we, we have that ability, but we think we have people who would be interested. 
Okay, and actually, that was so. That was the second half of my question. It's just, do we, if 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 the consensus is this is too much work, do we have a a sense of what we would pair? What would be the first things to come off this list? Is that something that you've thought through as part of this? And is and if so, is that information that you can share just so we would have a sense? Yeah, I think you know I mentioned the streetscape uh, standards, and um, so I think we're going to try to in the response or somehow we try to separate that out as a, as a discrete piece. So that would be one, uh, because we are gonna apply for some other grants to try to accomplish that in the next year. Um, other than that, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, how do you pair it back? So we can negotiate with the, you know, the, the selected professional. And so some of it could be, um, you know, are there meetings that staff could do? Are there things that we could reduce in terms of, um, Expectations. So, for instance, uh, we have six meetings uh, later on in the process. Six meetings with different public boards to to um, review the design standards. And is that something that you know staff could do? They could be recorded Zoom meetings, but maybe we facilitate, and then the consultants could watch. But you know, do we help with more mapping or technical things? Or you know, so um, we haven't really decided. You know, we haven't determined exactly how we would. You know. I would say I don't want to take out anything, but um, yeah, yeah, you know. If, I mean, it, it, I think it's just a sort of a useful sort of thought exercise, anyway. It's just for us to have a sense of what's critical, what's nice to have, what's need to have, things like that. But uh, yeah, so I think you know, I, we have met and we said so. For instance, if we're asking for too big of a scope, you know, we're saying, oh, let's do a visioning process. Let's look at a pretty big area. And if it really seems like that, it, the whole, from the start, it seems like it's too big of a project. We could say, okay, let's pare it down. Let's say, let's draw a specific boundary to where we want the consultant to work. So the consultant isn't spending their time kind of determining where to apply the standards. We, we show that on a map and we say, maybe it's, you know, uh, two properties beyond the BG or BL, right? Or we, we draw a boundary. We say it's, you know, um, North Prospect Street to Halleck to North Pleasant to Triangle to whatever. And we, you know, and that might take out a lot of that, the work of the consultant to have some of this first uh, visioning step. So yeah, there are ways we could do it. It's just, you know, I'm hoping if we have this team, you know, they could, they could do that visioning and say, oh, here's where the appropriate boundaries could be for the design standards, not us saying, well, just focus on the BG and BL because what if they said, oh, wow, actually these, few RG properties right next to the BL might be really great to have design standards on. Um, so. Very good. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Doug. Um, Janet. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate all the work that you put into this RFP. It's a really strong document. It's, I think it has a really clear, um, you know, it lays things out really clearly. And I think this is gonna be a really exciting process. It's kind of like one of the reasons I'm on the planning board um, I was also really interested that it included talk about the dimensions of the downtown and parking strategies and density recommendations, because it's kind of like kind of broader of a scope that I had expected. Um, I did think like the RFP could do some ads. And one of them was I thought that it doesn't I think the R, we need to mention that we're a college university town and we have a majority of student residents and that I thought this would be a great opportunity to have the consultant look at um, you know, research and get examples from other really successful college downtowns. And so, um, so I, I just thought that was a, you know, a big, a big opportunity for us to get some good looking, you know, examples and, you know, downtowns that really work for university towns or college towns. Um, the other thing I was a little worried about the stakeholders that it was, might be too limited to sort of property owners and business people or, or, um, and I just thought it should be a more like, it, you know, it's not a, you didn't say only that, but nothing, nobody else was mentioned. And I thought it could be more inclusive and that it should include the residents of downtown, which are students, people living at Air and Whalen and Clark houses, um, and also, um, you know, residents of the RG. And so that, you know, and maybe in, instead of one-to-one -one interviews, maybe some focus groups. I also um, thought that, um, you, like to bring more in the BIPOC community in terms of specific outreach strategies. So, you know, a stakeholder meeting or a focus group that includes BIPOC people 
and a real effort to reach out to the communities that we often don't talk to. And so I thought that had to be kind of put in there front and center. Um, and I know we're all, you know, the town's been really working well on that. Um, so that was that was my two big points. And then I just thought some little tiny ads of, in terms of source documents, um, the Historic Pre Preservation Plan, which I think I have the right name of, the Design Review Handbook and the Kendrick Park Plan. Um, those were things that are real affected by downtown. So that that's really it, but I just, I think it's a great RFP and I just think a few more things could strengthen it and kind of maybe get a little bit more out that would be very focused on Amherst's needs. So thanks. Yeah, um, Doug, if I could, the uh, yeah, stakeholders are interesting. We, the, when we had the 4DR process, the consultants, you know, met with stakeholders and then the difficulty was, you know, they met with some property owners downtown and business owners and managers, but then they're also residents, but they weren't specifically only residents. They were a combination of things. And so if we do like the idea of, a, I think, you know, Janet's a good point. I think we have all these other types of outreach. And so if we think stakeholder meetings or focus groups are important, you know, let's consider who to ask because I, you know, it'd also be great to have residents of North Amherst and South Amherst as part of stakeholders. And so I do think, you know, staff, we discussed this, like, is there enough of an outreach process that maybe we don't need stakeholder meetings or are, do we think they're important enough? Um, so what if we did a type of survey where we could get opinions, uh, the same type of feedback, but from a larger group? So I think that's a good point. In terms of, um, you know, the BIPOC community, and we've also thought about, you know, how do we incorporate sustainability into these standards? And so I will say that the comparative re review criteria, you know, we, I had a list of like what it was, right? So in your community engagement plan, have a description of how you would, um, you know, perform the outreach in terms of steps. And then you're supposed to list under, we have um, highly advantageous, advantageous, and not acceptable. And under those, in those three categories is where we would say, what is highly advantageous? So I think what you were saying in terms of having a better outreach process to reach different communities, that would be highly advantageous. And so we may or may not say it um, in the, explicitly in the document, but in our review criteria, we'd call those out. So you know, the consultant would see that the, res the respondents would see it and they say, okay, you know, how, how am I reach, how am I going to achieve this um, outreach? How am I going to make it sustainable in terms of my standards? And so when the trust developed the RFP for Belcher Town Road and East Street School in the comparative re review criteria in those categories, that's where we actually had a lot of the substantial kind of um, thresholds to really try to get out a proposal that would get what Amherst wants, right? So when we asked for out marketing and outreach for the affordable units, we said it has to, you know, the highly advantageous was, you know, you'd have a community liaison who would go to the BIPOC community and do physical outreach at locations in Amherst, right? Which is well beyond what a typical marketing plan requires. And so I, I will say that I didn't get to write some of those comparative re review criteria you know, the highly advantageous, advantageous. So I think what you were saying would go in that. We can mention it in RFP. And I think then in the comparative re review, we can call it out for each of those um, submittals, right? So in terms of their methodology and approach, what's highly advantageous? We want them to have, you know, um, you know, a good outreach plan. We want them to have sustainable design um, principles. We want them to, you know, so we can put you know, criteria in that, you know, review, right, to really make sure it, they can respond to it. Um, so, yeah, I think those are good ideas. All right. Thank you, Janet. Um, I, I, I will say, Nate, that I didn't realize you hadn't sort of that, that there, those criteria were, in essence, missing. Well, so some, some just say you, if you exceed what's written, it's, it's, okay. And then for advantageous, you say it meets what you've said, but you can also then uh, kind of enhance those and, you know, really be explicit, right? So someone could say in their timeline, here's our timeline, right? Every month we have a meeting and here's the milestones. But then another proposal, if we say a highly advantageous is, you know, in addition to um, a schedule, there's a narrative explaining how they will um, incorporate comments into their next set of um, public material, right? And so we can write that as the highly advantageous. So if in their timeline and schedule, they just show us a matrix and they have the colored, you know, blocks and everything, okay, they, they're advantageous. But if another response is like, 
here's how we're going to take all the material we're, we've gathered at this step and how we're going to make it better and incorporate it in the next step. That's highly advantageous. So, you know, typically we, we try to write that in a little bit just so we can have separate out the proposals. Otherwise it is difficult because if you have professionals responding, oftentimes, um, you know, they always, you know, hopefully they meet the minimum and most of them are advantageous. And so then you really do want to have some, some clarity between what is advantageous and highly advantageous. Um, you know, otherwise you, you, you know, almost, you almost have a tie um, between responses. And so you really want to have some kind of distinction if you can. It, it does get difficult, I will say. The more criteria and the finer grain, the more you have to have some distinction. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria. Um, thanks, Nate. Um, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this finally happening. This is so fantastic. Um, but I do agree that uh, this is a huge scope, a huge undertaking. Uh, real quick, first question. How do you guys remember the fee, the 40R uh, project cost? The one we just did and didn't do anything with? What, what was that consultant fee? Do you remember? Yeah, I think it equated to twenty thousand dollars. Oh, it's not so all. Okay. Okay. I think they went a little beyond what. Right. I remember them yeah. saying that. Okay. Well, so I think my only thing about like looking through your um this document is maybe um try to if if you were to need to um, prioritize you know say the fee isn't quite enough um uh, maybe really tailor the scope of services where you really use them for the outreach for the creating of the um i guess what's that called distilling of the zoning bylaw into this new product and keep a lot of what you have on page two where you have a lot of like the review existing documents and the document existing conditions have more of the staff either do presentations or collect a lot of that data prepared so that the, you know, you're paying the consultants to do what they do best, which is sort of distill the information rather than collect the information. I know they'll learn more if they collect it themselves, but I, I am a little worried about this two year, $100,000 um, sort of scope. I, I just, I, I know how important the public outreach will be. So we really want to make sure that's not just sort of like a, <clears throat> A complaint fest, but that really becomes like a a way of gathering data that isn't like an overwhelming amount of data that no one ends up really distilling or doing anything with. So I feel like maybe you know um, if more of their scope is um, yeah less of what's on page two and then more of what's on page three, which is develop um, the design standards and. I guess maybe, you know, as long as like, I hear what you're saying about you're being very precise and specific about what you're asking for. And I think that's really great. And then hopefully they'll, like you say, you know, show a couple of projects, recent projects, so you can get a sense of how they'll deliver things because, you know, the 40 hour project, uh, I thought that deliverable was um, good graphically, but it didn't have a lot of meat to it. So I, I don't, you know, I want to make sure that um, and it looks like you're asking for really specific things. So I just want to make sure we don't sort of repeat that where um, we have just enough sort of beginnings of an idea and then it doesn't go anywhere. And um, so it sounds like you're you're in that path. Um, but I would say maybe it's just, a, you know, really, really take advantage of town staff and planners, all the expertise and the collective historical knowledge you already have and, you know, really help them. Um, once you select one, uh, uh, let them do the front of the sort of, you know, um, breaking down the data rather than collecting the data. Um, but otherwise, this is really fantastic. I, I hope even after I'm off the planning board, I, I go to a couple of these public meetings and just see how it's all going because um, it was a long time coming. I'm so glad that you guys are doing all this because um, it's a huge endeavor. <laughs> I've been through a few steering committees for for, for town downtown uh charrettes and yeah we we needed a consultant but <laughs> this is definitely something you need hired experts for so i'm really excited about this and um uh i uh maybe what i'll do is i'll comb through this document again i didn't have time to do a lot but i i can note like where i think maybe you could you know eliminate or take out of their scope so that then 
more of that hundred thousand is really, you know, um, put to good use. But um, thank you so much for all this effort. It's been fantastic. Okay, thanks, Maria. Janet, you have some more. Um, yeah, I just wanted to respond. You know, something that Nate said reminded me of. Um, I think they were the forty R meetings that I heard a lot of complaints or and, and actually sort of understood the feeling what when you did a charrette and people wrote down, you know, what they thought, and then the, everybody comes back to the main group. And then, then nothing, like people didn't see a synthesis on, or they didn't under, they didn't see, they felt like they didn't see the consultants taking that information, consolidating it and presenting it in a way that others could look at it, or they felt like it didn't affect the outcome of what was being offered at the next meeting. And so I, when you were saying that, you know, that it's sort of next level, um, you know, most advantageous. And if you lay out that criteria, I think that's a really big missing piece at the few charrettes I've gone to where you just feel like, oh, everybody had this participatory effort. And then, you know, where did it go? And you, did someone take it in and summarize it? Anyway, so that's just a participant and then complaints I've heard observation. Okay, thanks, Janet. And sorry, Doug. And yeah, Maria, to your point, we, yeah, it's interesting. Staff had talked about, could we, use Engage Amherst and do the survey. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to, you know, complete it, you know, to draft a survey without the consultants, right? But could we then have them tell us or help us develop the survey, but then we, staff does the, you know, tries to get the, the responses. And if, and if, for instance, right, existing conditions, after we have the consultant, as we're going through, if it's contract negotiations, uh, what what would they do to document existing conditions in terms of measurements, photographs, and then staff could actually do it. So we spend the time, you know, measuring setbacks, measuring heights. And so, right, then that could take, you know, it could be a time consumptive um, part of their process that staff could do, right? If they're just, you know, measuring lot sizes using GIS and other things, we could do that. And so, yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, I was kind of optimistic we, we could just have... <laughs> have the consultant do, do it all, but I, I do think we're asking a lot. Um, okay, thanks, Nate. Um, I had a, just a couple of comments. Um, I agree, this looks to me like a $200,000 uh, effort, and it does, I, I'll be surprised if you can get it for 100. Um, particularly the number of meetings. I mean, you know, you, you are talking about 20 or 25 meetings. And um, that's a time consuming effort for a consultant. Um, on, the, on, on the comparative review, item six was the 15 minute presentation. Um, I wondered whether you really want to have a 15 minute presentation from all 30 responses you get, or whether you might want to have that as the secondary review uh, from a short list. Um, so, and you know, that takes time for somebody to prepare too. So um, if they're not sure they're gonna get the job, it might scare people off. Um, and then you had, you had the, the words diversity and inclusion as a criteria. Uh, kind of sitting all by themselves on uh, page seven. And I thought that looked like a fragment that belonged with public engagement or somewhere somewhere else. So, but sounds like you, you know you're not quite finished with this. Yeah, so I think to your last point, that's where, yeah, I put those words in. I, I was starting to try to fill out what would make things highly advantageous or advantageous and so that, in the comparative review, that wasn't necessarily complete. So I, I agree that that those were, um, you know, uh, just fragments. Um, in terms of the interview, I've been told that you, if it's a, and I think it's actually pretty clear in the uh, procurement guidelines now that if you intend to interview, even if it's a second round interview, you actually have to interview every response. So it can't just be, you know, we've narrowed it from 30 to 10, we're only gonna interview 10. You have to actually interview all 30 um, uh, responses. So if it, and if, you, or if, you're, and if you're gonna use the interview as any part of the comparative review or decision-making process, 
it has to be in the RFP document. So you can't, um, you know, decide, oh, let's have a second round of interviews and then we're going to throw in an interview. You actually have to have it be part of the comparative review up front. Um, in the past, okay. I'd say that some towns and maybe some towns don't follow that as clearly. And so you might hear about like, oh yeah, during the second round of interviews, we'll interview someone. But really, I've been told that it needs to be, um, you know, part of the process from the beginning. So I agree. Like if we have 10 responses and we have 15 minute interviews plus, you know, 10 minutes of questions, say it's a half an hour. So you have, you know, you have a few hours of uh, just interviews. Um, okay. All right. Well, I, you know your process and I, I have my experience is on a different type of process. No, thanks. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually pleased to hear that your the 15 minutes is what you're talking about as the presentation from the people and that there's maybe some Q&A after that. Right. So having, because I misinterpreted that, I thought oh, okay. the entire start to finish was 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. So you might want to clarify that it's a 15 minute presentation that's part of a 30 minute interview or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but overall, I can't wait to see it happen. Uh, I guess the, the only other thing I'll ask is how involved are you going to be willing to have the planning board in this process? <laughs> oh, as, be as, as Janet, as Janet said, you know, this is the this is exciting stuff. You're going to be organizing the monthly meetings. So you're going to be. Uh, <laughs> no, I, yeah, when we've um, you know, it's a really good question. I think we. Um, you know, when you've done like Roth Park or Kendrick Park or other projects, we have kind of a team, you know, staff and others that really will be part of the project. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think there, you know, at, at some point it becomes either a subcommittee that has to be a publicly posted meeting every time the planning board members discuss it, or, you know, is it, you know, one representative and it gets reported back. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's a good thing to discuss. How, how does the planning board want to be involved in terms of when this is happening? Um, you know, and we say two years, it could be faster. At one point we were saying, oh, 15 months, but realistically, if it is sooner than two years, great, but I don't want to push it or shortchange it, right? It um, seems like a long time, but the 40-hour process took quite a few months. Um, and then just to have, you know, time between meetings and allow the consultant to do some work, um, I think it, you know, if we okay. think, too, if, you know, we could always put it a shorter time frame, but. Well, you also don't want to fatigue people. Right. So it's a balance. All right. Is yeah. there anything else you wanted out of us this evening, Nate? No, I do think that's a good question, Doug, about the planning board. And I'm sure others would want to be involved too. And so, yeah, I guess that's something staff hasn't discussed, you know, yet is really how, you know, what is the team moving forward if this were, you know, when this is happening. So, um, yeah. Okay. I see Chris's hand. Maybe she wants to comment. I just wanted to ask Nate a question. Um, Nate, do we want to invite planning board members to send written comments? Um, I know Maria offered to do that, and um, I'm not sure if Janet offered to do that or not, but um, is that something that would be helpful, or do you feel like you've gotten enough comments from this discussion tonight? Um, yeah, I think written comments are fine. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to burden planning board members, but if you have them or if you take a notes and you want to send them to me, that's fine. Or if you want to look at it again after tonight and send me more, um, that, that's great. Do we have a deadline by which we would like people to send their comments, like before the next planning board meeting, before May 4th? Yeah, that, that sounds good. good. That sounds good. In the next week and a half, two weeks, I don't know. So I assume all comments should be sent to Chris and then Chris, you'll pass them on to Nate. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah, I just, I'm uh, having memories of uh, some bad experiences with uh, charrettes <laughs> within Amherst. I don't think it really works. So, and I, um, I, you know, encourage Nate to kind of do more, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the table at the farmer's market, that sort of thing, but just getting a large group of people together, um, 
I think lack decorum. Um, I, I was actually embarrassed, I think, in some of the downtown, uh, you know, uh, work groups that we've had. Uh, Chris, remember? Um, <laughs> people yelling. So uh, that's Amherst. And so I'm sure you're very much aware of that, Nate. So thanks, Jack. Chris? I just wanted to respond to that, which is that sometimes people treat their own family members worse than they treat their friends or the public. And I think we experienced that um, at that meeting where residents felt like they could be pretty outspoken to planning board members and staff. But I think people are not as free to be, um, I'm not exactly sure how to characterize what they were, but anyway, they're not as free to be uh, as outspoken perhaps with a consultant. They're more, um, they act with more decorum with a consultant because a consultant is not a, a family member. So anyway, I just wanted to offer that. We're hoping that the consultants will be um, strong people and able to withstand, but also that um, members of the public will be respectful of them. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, I see one hand in the attendees. Uh, Pam Rooney, state your name and your address. Thanks, I wasn't sure if you're gonna have any public comment. This is Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, I'm just here as a resident. And I just wanna commend Nate for a really terrific RFP. And again, I will echo that I'm very excited to see this starting to take shape. Um, I, I was thinking, as you said, how, how could some of this be pared down? And uh, Janet McGowan beat me to the punch on one of them. And that is that the idea of, of you know, 12 stakeholders um, might be winnowed down to four or five focus groups containing some of those stake member categories. And um, she actually named off some of the ones that I was thinking about, the Ann Whalen and Clark House residents, uh, close in neighborhoods, property owners, um, as in the bid, business owners, as in the chamber, um, and then the student rent renters or people from who actually live downtown and, and walk out outside day to day. Um, in that same section that described the, the, I think it must be task two, uh, a wonderful idea of, of coming in with case studies. I thought that was terrific. Um, but if, if you're mentioning case studies, um, the fact that, that, again, Ms. McGowan beat me to this, but if, if you're recommending things, um, examples of college towns is really good because it's, we're sort of a, it's a different breed of cat. Um, but also that that case studies that might show mixed use and mixed populations, because I think we really do want mixed populations in whatever density we develop downtown. Um, but also the words adaptive reuse, I think is something that's critical that we that we clearly need to deal with in uh, certainly in the BL districts downtown. So um, adding the word adaptive reuse would be very helpful to help flesh out where good examples might come from. Um, and, and then when you're looking at, at the rest of that paragraph, um, you know, bringing, bringing forward images, plans, information on building use, and maybe adding the word occupancy because, um, you know, just to have a square footage amount is one thing, but to actually understand how many people you might be having living there is, is, a, is a, an important element as well. So thanks, and I'm, and I'm just delighted to see this. Um, thanks for working on it. Thank you, Pam. Um, I see Dorothy Pam, if we could bring her in. Okay, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. And again, I'm speaking as a resident. Um, I think that uh, uh, as Nate tells it, it sounds like a lot of thinking has gone into this and a, a lot of good ideas. Um, I would, in terms of, of um, people that you would reach out to for comments, I hope that you would reach out to the nearby residential neighborhoods, people who use the downtown on a regular basis um, and who are right close to it. Um, but the main thing I want to say is thinking of the 40R is I hope that you can include 
and then maybe this will be part of the stuff that is that you add up and what it's going to cost that the consultants spent some time to get to know Amherst, to visit Amherst. Um, there was a sense with the 40R when some of the people responded in disbelief at some of the pictures they were showing that the person didn't know Amherst or hadn't been to Amherst. So um, that might be something extra you'd have to figure it on, on the expense side that they would at least, they have to get to know the town. They have to come and see it, walk around in person and not just read about it. Um, you probably have already thought about that's already probably in your RFP. I don't know, um, but that's my thoughts. So good luck to this. I think it'll be a great project. Thank you, Dorothy. All right, um, Nate. Unless you need anything more from us this evening, we can end this topic. No, great. Thanks. I was just gonna, yeah. Thanks for the comments, everyone, um, and from the attendees. I think, for instance. Um, Dorothy's last comment about getting to know Amherst. Again, I think that's something I'd like to um, uh, incorporate into the review criteria so that, you know, their methodology methodology and approach, you know, highly advantageous would be something that they, you know, um, that they understand Amherst or that there's evidence that they, you know, visited Amherst or understand, you know, its context. And, you know, so I, I like, you know, I think those are the, that's where we would try to, um, you know, make sure the people responding, you know, are serious about it and we can get someone who really is, you know, uh, serious about the proposal. So, yeah, I, I think all those, these comments have been really helpful. Um, I like the idea of focus groups as opposed to stakeholders, just because I think that could be a better way to get feedback. Um, yeah, no, I think there's, I, I'll, you know, there's a lot to think about. And so I'll, you know, if you send me comments, I'll probably do track changes and keep a document that you know keeps evolving. Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of excited too. It was a lot of work at first, but once you get started, I um, <laughs> you get carried away <laughs> with what you're asking for. So it's nice to hear uh, hear all the comments. All right, thanks, Nate. So the time is eight thirty-five, and we haven't taken a break yet. Do people want to take a break? Or I know uh, one member had been interested in finishing by nine. So uh, if that's the case, I see two thumbs up. Maybe we'll move right on. Um, all right, so the time is 8.35 and we'll go on to item five on our agenda, which is old business. Starting with the solar bylaw working group, we need to nominate a member to represent the planning board on this working group. Um, Chris, did you want to say anything or? Yes. Um, yes, okay. Yes, so um, you all have a copy of the charge of the um, solar bylaw working group that was put together by the town manager and Stephanie Ciccarello and myself. And it's essentially um, a seven member uh, group that will be in place until May 31st of 2023. And that's when we're expecting to have the solar bylaw um, finished and the um, solar siting study also finished. Um, and we're invited to have one planning board member be a member of this group. And there will also be representatives of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, Conservation Commission, Board of Health, Water Supply Protection Committee, and two residents with solar and or forestry or other relevant experience. So I've received two um, emails of interest um, from planning board members. Um, the first one came from Janet McGowan uh, to be the planning board's representative. And the second one came from Doug Marshall um, for, to be the planning board representative. I haven't heard from other members of the planning board about um, their interests. So um, Doug, you may wanna ask if any other members are um, wanted to step forward. Sure, were, were there others who were interested? Uh, Jack, I see your hand and Andrew, you can follow Jack. Yes, um, I'm on the Water Supply Protection Committee and I'm uh, really into it pretty deep uh, with regard to, uh, you know, environmental impact um, of this from, from a water resources perspective. And I, I offered to be the representative for, for that uh, committee. So we'll, we'll see. Um, and, but I, I don't think I, you know, should throw my hat in the ring for the planning board. <laughs> Um, well, I think we discussed last time that since you and, and Maria are not going to be on the planning board necessarily after 
whenever it is, is it June yeah. or July, um, that you probably shouldn't be our representatives from the planning board. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I was not going to put my hat in, but I saw um, Janet's letter and I was, it, was there another letter from Doug or I, I, I had emailed I didn't even realize. Chris, Chris last night and I oh. think probably okay. sent that around to everybody. Late I didn't get to my email today. Okay, I may have not seen it. It was fairly belated. I wasn't really sure whether I really wanted to do it, but I'm interested. I'm interested in the topic. That's really the, the bulk of it, but I'm not, I'm not going to push. I'm not going to campaign for this. <laughs> um, Andrew, did you want to say something else? I mean, I, I was going to make a motion, but I see Maria's hand up first. So maybe let see what she says first. All right, Maria. Um, do we have enough? What will we be voting? Because we have five people present, but I don't know if Doug and Janet would be voting. Like, what is the process for this? Well, this is similar to selecting officers. Is it? Okay. And I guess my understanding is that we typically all vote on that. Is that correct, Chris? Okay. That is correct. Yes. Um, That's all I want. Then Andrew. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I could make it easy and just withdraw <laughs> if that's what people would like. Um, go ahead, uh, Andrew. Did you want to speak? Uh, yeah. Well, my I was going to make a motion to recommend uh, Janet uh, for the committee. All right. Do we have a second? Uh, Maria. What if I had wanted Doug to be on the committee? Then what does that mean? Would I vote a no for Janet and then try again for Doug? Or how, how does that work? Well, I mean, I suppose we could just have a, a, a kind of a roll call of uh, who would support Janet for that position and then who would support me for that position. Is that a reasonable way to tally the votes? Well, I would support me and I would support you, Doug. Just you know. <laughs> you have a quarter we can flip. I don't think. Well, you know what? I mean, I'm. I mean, I'm, I'm already the chair. I don't really particularly need to go to two more meetings a month. Um, Janet, would you? Why don't I second uh, Andrew's motion? Okay, and then I'll second Maria's. <laughs> no, we only have one motion on the floor. Oh, okay, tomorrow. okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so, um, okay, so we have a motion on the floor to, for Janet to be the representative. Um, I'm gonna do a roll call vote. Um, All right, so I'll get my list of people. All right, Maria. So I'm voting whether or not I want Janet, not knowing whether you're going to be on the table. Is that right? Yeah, that seemed like a good idea. Is it not a good idea? That's fine. Um, uh, I'll say, OK, yes. All right. Um, Jack? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good with Janet. I just would uh, kind of uh, you know, we, we, we pulled some uh, examples from some nearby towns, which I think are, are super conservative. And I would just, you know, ask that Janet looks at, you know, the bigger picture uh, and not, you know, I, I think there's some like an anti-solar sentiment out there from some of the towns. And so I just would ask that she, you know, be level <laughs> on that perspective. So, but yes, I'm, uh, I, uh, I approve for Janet, yeah. Okay, Andrew? Aye. All right. Um, I can, I can, I, I feel like I should abstain since I was, and Janet, I assume you would vote yes? I, I would vote for me, but I also plan to vote for you, so. <laughs> So that's three votes in, in favor of Janet. 
So four, four. right? Oh, or four, four, four. Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. So do we want to? Is that good? Are we done? Nate. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I was going to ask Chris to clarify. I think as um, sometimes working groups don't uh, necessarily need to have a public meeting with a posted agenda, but I think this one will. Um, right, Chris? This will be yeah. at post yes. meetings. The working group? This working group will act like a committee and we'll have posted meetings and minutes and the whole nine yards. That Right. And so I was going to just say, yeah, as I say, because of that, you know, members of the planning board could also attend and provide input. You just, you're not, you know, you're just not a voting member. So, you know, the charge does say community input. It sounds like it'll be a pretty interactive process. And, um, you know, and then there's also the solar assessment that's ongoing as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think it'll be a good group to have community input and then come up with a, with a bylaw. And I'll probably be the one who's attending and helping to take minutes and other things too, so. <laughs> While you're working on your design guidelines. Sure. And, and attending 20, 20 meetings for that. <laughs> Okay, so we got 15 minutes to finish up, guys. Okay. Uh, let's see, next, 8.44 is the time. Chris, uh, next item on uh, old business is fees for public hearing legal ads. So we introduced this topic last time. Am I muted? I'm not muted. No, no you're not. We can hear you. So um, I, I provided some information for the board about with this topic with the help of, um, of Pam, who did all the research, and I wrote the memo, and Pam and I wrote the memo. Um, so anyway, the planning board had, uh, we talked about the fact that planning board um, charges only $75 for each application um, for a legal ad but the average cost of a legal ad for the last six months has been $489 and 43 cents. Um, so um, the question is, does the planning board want to raise its fee from $75 to something else? Um, does it want to actually have the applicant um, pay the fee directly to the uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette, which is where we advertise? Um, and different towns do this in different ways. Um, the other thing is I, I have to mention that not all of our legal ads are for applications. Some of them are for zoning amendments so that we just um, submitted one for the zoning amendment for, what was it for? Um, I'm blanking right now. I think it was for de de um, demo delay. Um, and that was a pretty expensive one. The town actually has to eat that because um, there's no applicant to pay that fee. But um, in any event, we're talking about fees for actual applicants. Um, so we're considering two, two methods of dealing with this. As I said, one is to charge somewhere between $200 and $500 for each applicant for the legal fee. The other one is to have the applicant pay the Gazette directly. We've heard from um, different planning boards about what they do. Pam, Pam has done this research. The Hadley planning board sets their fee high enough to cover mailing and publication of legal ads. And they gave us an email about that. Sunderland charges $150 for legal ads and mailings. And the money goes into a general fund and then invoices are paid. I doubt that that's enough money to pay for legal ads and mailings. Deerfield has a, an advertising fee paid directly to the Greenfield recorder. And South Hadley, um, the applicant pays the actual cost billed directly to the applicant. And we did hear from um, one board, I guess it was the Hadley Planning Board, and I included some of your some of the emails in your packet. Um, the Hadley Planning Board said that it sometimes um, has has trouble, or it did have trouble in the past, um, having uh, someone pay the Gazette account because. Um, Many people don't have a Gazette account, so they can't get invoiced. Um, our, what our Conservation Commission does is they uh, send in the legal ad themselves, and then they get a bill, or a, not a bill, but a statement back 
um, with the proof of the legal ad saying how much it's going to cost. And then they chase the applicant to give them a check made out directly to Daily Hampshire Gazette for that amount. So um, this isn't necessarily something that we have to resolve tonight, but we're providing you with information about this. The planning board really should be involved in setting this fee. Um, my department actually also pays fees for the Historical Commission, the local historic district committee and the um, Zoning Board of Appeals. So, you know, we have to address this same topic with all of these uh, groups, but um, I don't know if you want to discuss this tonight or, you know, take the information that we've given you and put it on the docket for a future um, meeting or how you want to deal with this. You, Thanks, since Chris. Been... Andrew, do you have a suggestion or comment? I, I, I have just two thoughts, like none are really very good, but, you know, one is, I'm just wondering, has, has, has anyone ever talked to the Gazette about what they charge? Um, because, you know, it's doing a, it's a, like a public service. I'm, and I know that they're up for profit, but I just, you know, wondered whether, whether anyone had ever reached out and said, would the newspaper be willing to charge a flat fee or negotiate a fee? And then my initial thought when I, when I thought this was, you know, just let the applicant pay the cost, but that, you know, I don't know whether there's any mechanism for like a hardship waiver or something like that. Um, that we might entertain. I imagine that would make things could make things exceedingly complicated. But you know, five hundred dollars is a is a big pop to throw on for a, really a formality. But anyhow, those are those are my thoughts. Thanks. All right, Andrew. Um, Janet. So here are my deep thoughts. I thought that um, having the applicant pay directly and schedule the ad could be potential disaster in terms of um, setting up you know the right time for the public hearing and you know making sure they had paid and all that stuff so I thought that should be left in the hands of the planning department because they do that well and you know can sort out the calendar um, it did seem sort of expensive to me especially if somebody had to go you know do a hearing for a concom and a hearing for us and I began to wonder like when people come to us for public hearing, like how big are their projects or how small do they get? You know, is it, you know, we're not, we're not getting hearings about an ex, usually an extension, a small extension on a house or something, but I did worry about smaller applicants or um, nonprofits that these kind of fees could mount up. And so that was my concern. All right, uh, I guess my two cents was if the average cost is now $489, we should charge $500 and we should have the applicant pay us. And then we deal with the paper to make sure they get paid. And I'm not happy about that amount, but it covers our cost. Any other comments from people? Jack. Yeah, I was just wondering, like I'm getting uh, additional uh, papers. The reminder uh, has been coming and I don't even know the source of that, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if that, you know, that's a, a less expensive alternative uh, to the Gazette and would, would still qualify as, you know, for public notice purposes. I can tell you in my house, I only see it intermittently. It doesn't seem like a dependable arrival. Um, Chris, do you know any more about that publication? I think it's mostly a, um, an advertising vehicle. Um, and they do have a little bit of news in it, but it's mostly, um, you know, in, in a vehicle for advertising supplements to come out to, to people. Um, I can investigate it. One problem with it is it only comes out once a week. And we usually aim to have um, legal ads in like 15 days before a public hearing and seven days before a public hearing. And we kind of have to, you know, strictly um, deal with that deadline as a result of uh, public, um, public, the public notice requirements of the state. Um, I'm, I'm starting to lose my ability to talk, <laughs> but um, it's only not, not yet nine o'clock. Anyway, um, yes, the state requires that we publish the legal ad 14 days or 15 days in advance and seven days in advance. 
Okay. So that probably wouldn't work. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. I do see Nate's hand. Yeah. Thanks. The um, um, you know, there the, on the mass planners listserv, there has been a discussion about you know the requirement for posting, and it seems like it is becoming cost prohibitive, not just in you know for the Gazette, but everywhere. And some of it is just you know with shrinking subscriptions. Um, you know what's happening. So in southeastern Mass, you know a bunch of newspapers will close because it's a consolidated parent company. And so, you know, for instance, some communities might need to publish in the, you know, the Boston Herald or some, you know, some newspaper that's really towns away. And, um, you know, so some, some have been saying, well, could the law change, right? Can the law be updated to reflect some other type of posting? And so that's not the case yet. And maybe that's something that would be happening in the next year or two. Um, yeah, I do think it is expensive, but I, um, Andrew, I let your point about talking to them and maybe that there's just, you know, the cost of print and everything, there's just kind of a standard rate per character or space in a, you know, in a printed um, advertisement or legal ad. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure how much wiggle room there is, but, you know, on the listserv, others have said the same thing, you know, across the state that, wow, the cost of a public notice has gone up quite a bit. And so it's not as if it's, you know, the Gazette is raising prices um, and no one else is. It's really, I think, uh, across the board, something that's happening. So, you know, the, the cost of print is just increasing. And so, we're, you know, it's not, um, you know, it is just something that's, that's happening. Um, I agree that chasing an applicant could be, could be difficult. Um, I think, you know, I was going to say that right now, the planning department, you know, the way legal ads are paid, you know, there's a line item budget, but we're overspent quite a bit this year. And so every year we, overdraw that, uh, you know, our ability to pay for, for public notices. So it's becoming more challenging. You know, we have to estimate how much we're going to spend every year. And so it is a pretty big line item budget now to do legal ads if the town is paying for it. That's All it. right. Thanks, Nate. Um, Chris, uh, I, ideally, it sounds like you want us to somebody to make a motion and and all of us to endorse some particular solution. Is that right? Yes. And and you want that to originate with us or do you want that to originate with you? Well, maybe I will take this back to my staff and to um, Dave Zomek, who is my direct uh, boss and talk to him and them about this because as I said, this has a ripple effect. Um, you know, if the planning board changes their mode than the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Historical Commission and the um, Local Historic District Commission have to also change. So I've, okay. I've gotten a sense of how you feel. So why don't I bring this back to you at a future date? Okay. All right. I briefly saw Maria's hand. Uh, no? Okay. All right. So end of that item, the time is 8.56. Uh, the last item on old business was topics not reasonably anticipated. Chris, anything? Nope. nope. All right. Item seven, uh, Form A, a and subdivision applications. Any of those? No Form A's. How about ZBA applications? Nothing new tonight. All right. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Item nine on our agenda yes we have two new ones let me see if i can remember them um one is from john robleski and it has to do with a new building that's going to go in at 446 main street that will be coming before you probably on may 18th and there is another one um and it escapes me i didn't Right. Uh, yeah, the UMass Five College Credit Union, Chris. Yes. Is that... Thank you, Nate. Yep. <clears throat> so UMass Five College Credit Union is coming in for a new building on uh, Northampton Road in Amherst. Okay. Yes, and we may we may have told you about that one before. I'm not sure, but anyway, yes, that's coming as well. And then, of course, we have um, the new building on Olympia Drive. So those three are coming before the planning board. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item 10, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Jack, anything for PVPC? Yeah, we had a quarterly meeting with the uh, commissioners last week. 
and Chris sent the presentation for the housing. So uh, the, the feature talk was about, um, you know, uh, having um, affordable housing, you know, within the Pioneer Valley. And I just, you know, I would just say that <laughs> what we're experiencing here is it's across the country. You know, I think I've been feeding Chris some things that she's been distributing, but again, I'm really glad that, that this is, you know, being uh, looked after, you know, with, within our, you know, within our region and it's getting energy. And uh, so, um, yeah, seems like a little bit of a housing crisis here across the country. But, uh, All right, thank you. Yeah. CPAC, Andrew? No updates. Okay. Uh, Tom is absent, so nothing on the DRB. And Chris, anything from the CRC? The CRC held a uh, first session of their public hearing on April 14th on the demo delay um, bylaw, which is now being called Preservation of Historically Significant Buildings. They voted to recommend that the um, bylaw be removed from the zoning and placed in the general bylaw. Um, they haven't yet come to a conclusion about what exactly the wording will be of the general bylaw. They, um, Ben Breger of the planning department staff has been working with the historical commission to develop the language. He's bringing this back to the historical commission, I think tonight to get their opinion about a few issues. And then the idea is that it's going back to the CRC for their um, vote, we hope, on April 28th um, in, in a final version that we're hoping will go then to town council. So that's um, one thing that they've been focusing on. The other thing they've been focusing on is the rental registration bylaw. And this was brought to them by um, members of town council who are concerned about housing in Amherst and particularly rental housing, particularly um, the numbers of people who live there, the lack of um, maintenance and management on the part of some property owners and um, how to get a handle on that. And, and behavioral issues comes into this too, but um, that's not really a zoning issue. So anyway, they've been, they've been talking about that as well. So, uh, and they're also talking about how to extend article 14, which gives the building commissioner um, the ability to approve certain uses, um, particularly in the downtown area. Um, so that's what they've been working on. And their next meeting is the 28th of April. All right, thank you. Uh, next item, report of the chair. I really don't have anything to report this evening. Um, next, report of staff, Chris, Pam. I'd like to report that it looks like we're going to be finished with the meeting at nine o'clock and that's very um, good news and congratulations. My clock just meeting. went to 9.01. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, I do think we're through our agenda and it is 9.01. Any objection to adjournment? I did, Jack, I don't think you're objecting, are you? <laughs> All right, thank you all, and we'll see you, uh, was it May 4th? Yes, that's yes. right. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>